Hey, welcome to the Elijah Rising podcast where we discuss the myths, misconceptions, and most frequently asked questions about sex trafficking. I'm Adam and I'm joined today by my good friend and co-worker Sam, our mobilization director. And we are excited to have a conversation with one another today about- I'm excited to have a conversation with anyone. Any from, day. Because it's the first time I've left my house since quarantine. <laughs> That's so right. great. That's right. Um, so we, uh, Sam has already alluded to the fact that we are filming this right at the tail end of Hopefully, social yeah. distancing. Um, and normally the way that we produce these podcasts is we record them in advance. We have a guest, we have it all set up and ready to go. Um, but the pandemic has limited our ability to, to do that. And so we are going to have a rather organic conversation about Elijah Rising's uh, story in doing aftercare, doing restorative care. Yes, which I pushed for because this is truly one of my favorite stories because it's, um, just to give you a taste, to stay with us, it is one of the most impossible, yeah. miraculous, surprising, um, and encouraging stories that I've ever been able to actually walk through and see with my own two eyes and be a part of. So it's a real honor to share that testimony and yeah. what it was like for us being there and how we kind of got to this place that we're at now. Yeah, so let me just take us back to the beginning. So um, for those of you who kind of know my story with Elijah Rising, uh, I am an original founding member of the organization, one of the first staff members. Um, and I was with the organization for about four years uh, before I left and then returned. But um, in those early days, we were committed to three things. Still three things that we're committed to. Yes, today, prayer, awareness, and intervention. We started as a prayer meeting, which um, you can find that story in other places on our website and things like that and YouTube. We, we started as a prayer meeting and we pretty quickly started doing van tours and intervention work. Yes. Right. And so we did that. Sam came on board. Micah came on board about a year after we started that. Sam mm -hmm. came pretty quickly. He came in 2013. That. Okay. At a 22 years old. Yeah. Excited desperate to be a part because I was really, really, I so loved what Elijah Rising was doing. So. I remember that day, actually. <laughs> um, but in those days, and Sam, you'll remember this, we like, we explicitly said we are not in the business of aftercare. We're yes. going to do prayer. We're going to do awareness. And we're going to do intervention really well, which you really kind of took us to the next level with intervention. Uh, but we said, we're not doing aftercare. Yeah. And we were, you know, Redeemed Ministries, who's been around probably the longest in the city, was yeah. doing it. Um, and we, it was, it's so much, like it's a lot. And we said, look, yeah. we're not going to do that part of the thing. And we're like, for sure, we're not going to do it. Um, and so we proceeded with that mindset, really. Um, but well, And we also thought, I mean, we had conversations the other days where it was like, Redeemed is doing this well. Um, why would we reinvent the wheel or yes. why would we wait into a space? And I think in our minds, like we thought that gap is already filled. Like yes. we have an organization here. There are other organizations and other places that are already doing this. Let's do what we do well. Yes. And, but we always had this at the time we didn't have the rescue Houston hotline, which has yep. been a huge help. That's right. We had the Polaris hotline and we had some other resources, but you know, every, all these different pieces on a map, we hadn't had that pipeline of connection yet for everything. And I always remember this scary moment. Like we'd go out on the street, we'd go to the hotel, we'd yeah. do intervention. And it was kind of like looking around, like whose house are we going to take someone to if someone needs help out, yeah. which is not something we suggest no. at all, which there are great resources now, you know? Um, but in those days there weren't really, there, yeah, there weren't resources. And, you know, even redeemed, they were amazing, but the appropriate thing to do is to have an application process to make right. sure that they're maintaining the safety of their home. And we could not, you know, if someone's like, Hey, I need help right now. I don't want to go to the police. It, it was just a mess. And so Mike, our executive director, she almost got in trouble with her, um, apartment complex. Cause she had yeah. these ladies living in her house with the end of the day, we we're just trying to say, look, we're going to fill any need we can in the midst of trying to get you into a program. But, um, but we still kind of walked forward in this whole mindset of like, we're not doing restoration, yeah. just getting the intervention and passing it off to the next part. Yeah. And I mean, and it was a real God thing. I mean, it did, it took a few years as yes. you know, of this, um, it, the way I always tell the story is like, we were committed to prayer awareness and intervention and we did it well. And guess what? It worked. Like yeah. it, <laughs> it actually started creating exits and exits in, 
and then the hotline came on board. So shout out to rescue Houston. Love you guys. Um, you know, the, the hotline came on board 24 yes. seven. Anybody could call that number and have an, have a, have a safe exit facilitated, which was huge. It was huge. Incredible. Yeah. And then it started happening though. Right. Yes. It started happening a lot. People were making phone calls. People were, were getting out. And I loved, and I always even suggest to like volunteers, if you're interested in getting involved in this fight, do outreach with any yeah. organization because you get to have that one-on-one time with women who are in the place of their oppression and you get to learn more and hear from them instead of just like, well, I know about sex trafficking. Now I want to work in direct aftercare, something right. like that. which sometimes that works for people, but I so suggest getting involved because it gave Elijah rising years to be on the street, to hear stories, to be sitting in hotel rooms, sitting in the backseat of a, you know, yep. like a, a police car when someone gets arrested to have a car. And it, it just gave us this opportunity to really understand, um, as much as we could, to some extent, the plight of the people that we were serving. But then, yeah. you're right, we, it started working, and all of these women were getting out, and they were getting rescued, but also they had nowhere to go. And yeah. it was extremely stressful. And Redeemed, again, you know, shout out to Redeemed, we, loved you, we love you guys, but you know, capacity is capacity. Yeah. Like, when you meet capacity, you're you're done because you know, and redeem does long-term restorative care. So it's about a two year program. And they've graciously really helped us and kind of mentored us in the process of us putting together our program, which we very much appreciate. So we pretty quickly started to realize that, you know, doing intervention every single week and doing awareness every single day and doing prayer every day was resulting in these exits. The hotline was running. And so suddenly we went, yeah. And so there's this big tension. Everyone right. is like, <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, like, what are we going to do? What do I'm, we do now? And I remember I already have anxiety. Like, um, <laughs> so I would have these intervention nights where one night 99 people showed up in a building that really only fits 40. Right. And I'm like, where, and they're like, okay, if someone gets rescued, what are we going to do? Like if someone wants out, what are we going to do? And I remember just panicking all the time about it. Um, thinking, okay, let's just figure it out until one day yeah. we get this email, um, from, Someone, um, wonderful woman, um, godly woman from our church named Virginia. And she was just like, we found this property. It's out in the country. It's 85 acres and it's for Elijah rising. And we're like, uh, okay, no way. (laughs) We, I mean, we were like, this is our, we're number one. We're like, we were snobby loop people who were like, yeah, inner city life. Yeah. We're like, no, we're not going to have anything outside of like, you know, just right outside 610, not outside Bellway. Right. Um, (laughs) (laughs) and we're like, we're not going to do anything in the country. And we said, okay, look, look, we'll go and tour this property. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a video of us the original tour Mm. of the Elijah Rising restoration, uh, care campus. And, it was, I'm trying to describe what it was when we stepped out and we just started walking out. Yeah. What did that feel like? It felt like looking at a new country, like looking, going Mm. out and just saying like, this is so much potential, but it wasn't just like physical potential. It felt like physical potential with like spiritual, Uh, like energy. Like it reminds me of like, I think it's in the magician's nephew when they go to like, they're watching Aslan create Narnia and the earth is so fertile that they dropped a butterscotch and like a tree grew up. You know what I mean? So it's like this idea that we were walking in the, the ideas and the excitement about like, what could we do for women who have survived human trafficking in this much space. 85, 84 acres. Yeah. yeah, It was 85 acres. We gave one acre to our neighbor. Um, so, and we were like this, this could be absolutely life changing. And and I remember walking around like, what are we doing? Mm. What are we doing? It's like when you like get pregnant or something and you're like, Mm. my life is going to shift. Everything's changing. And I am terrified. Yeah. Um, Because we walked around like, oh my God, we could do this. I remember me and Micah specifically were like, we could have a garden here. We could do (sighs) this here. We could put this here. We could have a cafe for the women to work in. We could do this. And I was like, a market can be here. You know, funny. And and so it was, it was wild. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I, uh, and, and at and that you period of time, Houston. I was no longer with Elijah Rising. Uh, I left the organization. I went off to live outside of Waco, uh, had the honor of pastoring a church and getting a master's degree at Baylor. And um, 
but I was still very much connected to the organization just relationally and, you know, just following, you know, emails and social media and just, just in contact and back and forth to Houston. And so I got, <laughs> I, I remember the day I, I got, I was on the phone with somebody connected to the organization at that time. And they said, Adam, you won't believe what is happening right now. There is this piece of property, this massive 80 something acre piece of property that I, they said, we think it's for Elijah rising. And I said, well, what are they going to do with that much space in the middle of nowhere? And they said, well, it's going to be the restorative care camp. And I was like, there's no, they don't, we, Elijah rising doesn't do that. I wasn't with the organization at that time. I was like, but ER doesn't do that. And how in the world would they pay for that? How in the world would they exactly. ac- acquire that property? What would they do with it? And at that time, okay, look, I want to dispel a myth. That's what we do here on this podcast sometimes. I'm going to give away a trade secret here. A lot of people think Elijah Rising is a big organization, right? We have a great brand and we work really hard on that. And so, and we do a lot of great work. So it looks like we're this massive organization. We're not. We're a really small nonprofit. And in those days, we were a small, small nonprofit, very small. Small nonprofit, good Photoshop skills. Good Photoshop <laughs> Like, <laughs> nice website. <laughs> and so I just, I just thought to myself, I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. And the really us, it's like our numbers are in our volunteers. We do right. have, a, you know, over a thousand volunteers yeah, that are going right. out and doing outreach all the time. But the actual, like, people who work maintaining and doing things is very small. So then this thing happened and... We're like, okay, I remember us sitting at a table. We were having communion a lot, like really praying into it. Like it's a praise for $2.2 million. $2.2 million. Our operational budget at that time was $300,000 a year. Yeah, we yeah. Were, yeah. And so we're so like, impossible. Okay. We're That's like, okay. an impossible but scenario. But they're only asking like $1 million and some change. <laughs> okay, like fine. And then... So then we said, look, we're going to offer them $75,000. It was like 30% or something of what, you know, the original appraisal was. Right. And that's a crazy below offer because they had better. We knew that they had other offers. Coming. Right. So if they accept it, we know that the, Lord hand, the Lord's hand is on it. And I was like, we're all like, okay, we're so terrified. We, so what's going to happen next? And we will tell you right after this break. Hey, everybody. I hope you're enjoying today's episode of the Elijah Rising podcast. Right now, I'm standing in the Elijah Rising store that sells goods that empower survivors of sex trafficking. All the items in this shop, the purchases support the employment as well as the restoration of women that are in our program. So please come visit us at 11th and Studewood or online at shop.elijahrising.org. And today on your first purchase, we're going to offer you $10 off if you shop online using code podcast. Welcome back to the Elijah Rising podcast. And we're having a conversation about how Elijah Rising got into restorative care. So back to the story, you're sitting at this table and you're thinking, we're going to make a $75,000 offer on a property that's appraised for over 2 million asking prices over a million. Uh, What in the heck? So I just recently (laughs) bought my first house. And so before then, um, I, you know, I was 25, 24, 25 at this time, 24. I was because my birthday came right around that time. So I'm 24, no idea how even buying real estate. Mind you, I wasn't in charge of the deal. Don't worry. Sure. I, just, <laughs> I was just around. So apparently we had to submit some kind of letter that said how we intend to pay to the $750,000. Yeah. And so we turned in this letter that says, okay, um, if you accept our offer, God will give us the money. <laughs> um, and we're like, yeah. Okay, cool. So we send that off and we're like, well, if, if, if they're crazy enough to take it, um, then we know that the Lord's hand is on it. And so then it was my birthday party at Cottonwood. We were just hanging out and literally we get a phone call that says, Hey, they accepted your offer. 75,000, 75,000, $750,000. Yeah. We keep saying 75,000, $750,000, 750,000, almost a million dollars. Yeah. And we're like, Oh my gosh. Now, the crazy part, this is what is wild. Not only did they accept our offer, and it was on my birthday, which felt very special, but five <laughs> minutes later, we get, a, we get a phone call from yeah. Orphan's Promise that says, and they don't know all the details about this. They, I mean, literally, we just got an offer accepted. We hadn't really put it out there. 
nobody knows what's going on, but they knew that we wanted to start a social enterprise and they knew that we wanted to do something with women who survived. Cause mind you, we were still feeling that tension. Right. Um, and they said, Hey, we know you have some dreams to move your ministry forward. We want to give you $75,000, 10%, 10%, same day within five minutes of each phone call. We get the call. They accepted our offer. God gave us the 10% down yeah. and we were able to share the vision. Now what people, people have heard that part a lot, but what they don't know yeah. <clears throat> is that orphans promise in their own um, fundraising team, they said, man, I really feel from the Lord that we're supposed to give Elijah Rising $75,000 and this other nonprofit that fights human trafficking $15,000. But we don't have it in our budget. We literally don't have the funds. Mm. Um, but God, we just feel, we feel it so strongly. Lord, what are you going to do? Literally a week later, they get a phone call from a donor who says, we want to give you $90,000, but it has to go towards serving survivors yeah. of human trafficking. So it's faith upon faith, faith upon, upon faith. faith, but from not just Elijah Rising, from the people who accepted the the real estate offer, yes. right? Uh -huh. The low ball offer, right? The, which yes. is crazy. And then OP who came in and said, we want to do this too, but we've got to in, just really engage our faith to be able to even cover the promise that we just made. And then someone else who took a step in faith to give. Yeah, it's, yeah. And they have, and that's the thing when people give, they have no idea the answer prayers that they're, they're filling in and that literally that number. Which, so we've seen like God just move in this way, like yeah. and shock us every single time. So then we, we're like, okay, we have the 10% down. We have accepted offer. Oh my God, what do we do now? We have to believe God for the rest. Yeah, you can't stop at that point, right? Yeah, <laughs> we're like, cool, that felt really good. Now what? Um, because my, there's a lot more money to raise. A lot more money. You've only, I mean, there's 10%. God's provided it miraculously. The offer's been accepted miraculously. But guess what? There's 90%. 90% left to raise. Yes. And we said, hey, look, give us six months to get to closing. And they gave us, I think, 45 days. 45 days to raise three, like what? Two times, more than two times more of our yearly operational budget. Right. And the next few days or, couple, you know, weeks were the craziest weeks of our lives. And everyone was just like, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? I don't know if it's going to happen. And I'll never forget, I had people, because I sat at the very front of our office at that time, which was the um, old Angela Day Spa that we shut down. Right. And I had, I remember a woman walked in with $5,000 in cash in a manila envelope and she handed it to me. She had a name tag on and I said, oh, hey, who can I credit this donation? She covered her name tag and she says, it's just for the kingdom. And she gave us that money and walked away. Yeah. And that happened constantly. Everyone knew like this place is needed for survivors. And then when it came time to close, we were so like, we were so close, um, and we had $300,000 left and we said, we are not going to make it. And then someone said, Hey, we'll give you a private loan for the gap with no interest. Yeah. Um, you can pay it off in two years, which we did. And paid no it off in two it. years. So we went to signing and the sellers were not ready. They said, Whoa, y'all actually got the money. And so we, <laughs> we had to push it back a week, yeah. which ended up being Rosh Hashanah the day that we signed. Wow. So we felt like God's hand on timing for every single piece. Yeah. It well, it really is a story. It's a, it's a miracle story, right? And it's a story of expanding faith and really just expanding the mission of Elijah rising in a way that again, you know, like we never thought we'd end up doing this. Then all this happens and you just can't say no to God when every single door that needs to open, uh, swings open quicker than you can walk through the door even yeah. sometimes. So, yeah. so, okay. So we secure the property alone. So gets what did paid you, what off. was your response when you saw that we raised the money? I, I mean, you know, I told uh, before the break, I said, you know, I, I thought, well, this is crazy, right? This <laughs> is crazy. And so I definitely kept up with everything. And, um, I, you know, I heard about each one of those pieces as they fell into place and I just sat back and marveled. I have always believed that God's hand is on Elijah rising, that this is, this is an eternal work. This is a kingdom work and that what Elijah rising does you know, and I, and I'm saying this as a member of this, the staff again, but even when I wasn't on staff, I just firmly, firmly believe that what happens here, God is breathing on. Yeah. Um, and it was just a confirmation. I mean, I, I said it was crazy. It was crazy. Sometimes mm -hmm. God does crazy stuff. Yeah. And that was five years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, <gasps> literally to the oh, time because this... they accepted our offer on my birthday, which is May 11th. Wow. And we didn't plan to record this story today. Interesting. Thank and you, we're like raising, if I, anyway, yeah, we're in the good. middle of like a giving to, I feel a tear in my eye and I did not expect that. Wow. Um, 
that was five years ago. And like to this day, like doing restoration care is hard. Yeah. There have been many hardships on the way, like hiring the right people, finding, yeah. you know, what, you know, struggling with the women that we're serving, getting them what they need. And every single time I think back to that day yeah. on my birthday, those phone calls we yeah. got and, and Micah, I remember gave me a birthday card mm. that said, happy birthday. Here's 84 acres for a restoration <laughs> of survivors. Of trafficking. <laughs> and I remember screaming. <laughs> it's amazing. And, um, so it, it, I still think back to that and it builds my faith every time to go, even if it's scary right now, God has like set this up. Yeah because he wants it to succeed. And if God is for us, like why would he let us yeah. fail or us mess it up? So then what though? So, <laughs> <laughs> so now, now Elijah rising does restorative care. So then we just spent the next few years figuring out number one, this, this property is in major, yeah. like um, it needs major repair. So we all backpacked our little city, you know, suitcases up and we lived in homes with, and I think there was like a rumor going around at the time that we were like living, we raised funds for this like great property and we were all living for free and luxury. Yeah, no we luxury. didn't have running water. We didn't have electricity. I had water from a truck, from a tank that I filled up to like, and I had no stove. I had a, a grill inside my house that I cooked <laughs> every day. And oh we were, God. we were spending every weekend getting volunteers out to renovate the houses. Yeah. So because be the property was, we, we can't say a whole lot about the property because we want to protect its, you know, um, uh, anonymity. anonymity. Um, but it, the property did have a lot of structures on it, buildings yeah. and, and homes, single family dwellings, and then some much larger structures. Um, but it had been abandoned for yes. uh, yes. decades. And abandoned it, like it's crazy what time can do. So we literally yeah. spend the next years cleaning, um, demoing, painting, doing anything we could. Tell them about your skylight. Um, <laughs> I lived in a house that had a, um, a hole to the sky. And so <laughs> we called it our skylight. Um, others may call it, um, condemned, but you know what I mean? We, it was, you know, it was in process, it was in progress, sure. which is crazy because if you see the eight days of hope videos, the houses that they finished, like we started working on those houses then and they completely, I mean, these are like, yeah, just super nice, like unbelievably nice homes yeah. now. So we spent the time renovating. And then also, you know, when we had safe spaces, we did house women who'd survived sex trafficking temporarily to say, look, this isn't a program. Right. Um, it's just housing help. And it's amazing even then to see how God moved, yeah. how God moved to say, you know, we have one young lady who said, you know what, even though it wasn't a full program, it was exactly what me and my daughter needed. And I would not be alive and here doing what I'm doing today without it. And so God even used that time to serve 12 different women yeah. um, and kids as well, their kids as well. And some of those women came to know the Lord in that process. Oh yeah. Some All those, but maybe yeah. two came to really radically know Jesus or grow in their faith with Jesus. Baptisms. We had a horse trough that we yeah. did baptisms <laughs> in. I mean, we got real country while we were out there. I learned <laughs> killed snakes and, you know, learned how to take care of it. Cause it's a lot of land to steward. Yeah. And I'll never forget too, like, um, I, I'll, I'll remember this moment where I was pulling these roots out of a garden. I'm like deep, deep, gross roots. And I was doing it alongside one of the women we were helping. Um, and I remember it was this old rose bush that nobody cared about. And mm -hmm. it had just taken over this garden bed and started going under the house. So it was going to cause problems. And we were literally sweating and getting bloody, like, mm -hmm. you know, getting stabbed, like pulling yeah. this out. And she literally almost started crying and said, I understand why my sin is so hard to deal with now. Because like my heart is like these, they're these roots. Yeah. Um, and I was like, man, I guess that's why there's so, I'm a city kid. So I was like, guess why, that's why there's so much gardening in the Bible. Because you learn so much. <laughs> like, and we oh, Jesus, it. it makes sense now. <laughs> so it was that thing that I was saying, the land yeah. just felt so fertile with revelation right. and possibility that even in those times, like we were just gardening together and the Holy Spirit would move. Yeah. So, but there came a point, right, to where the staff realized that some things needed to change um, and that a, a a much more robust program with a lot more. Well, we just needed a program. Yeah, we, needed, we didn't it had have to a be program. built out, right? Yes, we had to build out a real program, and that took years. Like one thing that you're going to learn next time on the next podcast when Desiree mm. shares is, you know, they say how many beds do you have? Right. One bed is not a representation of what it takes to serve one person. That's right. It's an entire structure of restoration. So we spent the next few years building out that structure and looking for the people to run it, which we have Desiree, who we are. Yeah 
yeah. like which redeemed worked with for 10 years. Yeah. Like we're so grateful for her. She's the yeah. right person for the job. And, um, we spent the next years building out what we needed, what we need to do. And then also launching the social enterprise yeah, that's um, right. so that when they came, they would have a place to work. Um, and finally, we came to this day, October of 20, is it 2019? 2019, yeah. October 2019, right. where we, after years of this vision, literally toiling on the land, cleaning, you know, getting tractors and, and picking up brush and putting together um, systems and septics yeah. and um finishing these renovations and I always call it I was like this is the house that Houston built mm. the main the first house that we owned it had wall trimmings that were put in by some churches and and um, you know a refrigerator that was brought in by you know S- spring uh, spring Baptist Church like yeah. all these different churches came yeah. together and really built this house and then the contractors finished some last pieces and we had this beautiful home and on October 2019 we launched yeah um, and remembered like how much God has been faithful since the beginning. Yeah. And we were able to bring our first resident in who I remember she came in and they said that she was crying and she was like, where are we going to put our Christmas tree? Yeah. And I was like, five years of toiling, worth, worth it. it. Worth it. 100% absolutely worth it. Yeah, earlier in the podcast you said, you know, Elijah Rising, we're a small organization, but we're really volunteer run. I mean, and like everything that we've done has been um, because of our volunteer base. And, you know, so much of the work that was done out there was done by staff that was living in crazy conditions, but, you know, just giving themselves to the process. Yeah. But those volunteers from, you know, many of you probably watching and listening to this podcast, you were a part of that. This is also your story. And to come to today where we're in 2020 and just to, to see. So I, I, I want to ask you, I want you to think back to that moment where you stepped onto the land for the first time. Mm-hmm. And then I want you to think and how you felt. And then I want you to think about the last time you were out at the campus looking at the house or maybe when the grand opening of the first of the booth home, what the contrast between those two moments and what it felt like. Talk about that for a minute. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it felt so much like legacy, Mm -hmm. like seeing the time and the investment and this connectedness, like even David will say, uh, communications director who's also behind the camera, hey, David. That, that he was drawn in by the mission of this restoration campus. He yeah. was drawn in by that God's hand was on it. And all of us putting something, putting our hand in something, and then to just see it happening, to walk in and to smell someone cooking breakfast and making coffee that yeah, is being right. served there. Like it feels like legacy, like just knowing that, Everything that we did there and everything that I saw volunteers put their hands to, I mean, carrying mattresses and scraping, you know, dust and dirt and cleaning and all those pieces, seeing that we created a home. And I I remember always thinking that people would come in and say, how much money is it going to cost to finish it? Mm -hmm. How much, what money do you want? What money, what, what money can we just have it done? What money can we do to make the program? And in reality, it's not money, it's time, it's investment and it's long suffering and it's commitment. And I thought, man, how many women have been you know, um, in a program or, you know, trying to find healing that said, well, what do you need to just get over it? Right. And said, we need family and we need commitment. And I feel like I walk into that home now and I just feel the family and the support of the hundreds of people who've put their treasure, their, their, their hands to that place. Yeah. And, um, and then I think the women really know, like, I think that they know that so many people are have been there, have been behind them, and have put every pillow in its place, have put yeah. every, you know, planter there, and it's just the most magical, magical feeling. I yeah, love it. You know, the kingdom, um, God's kingdom, is really built on relationships. Yes. You know, and what brought Elijah Rising uh, into the work of restorative care was relationships with those that we were serving on the street. Yeah. And other organizations. And then what built out that campus was relationships. It, it, the, the money is critical, of course, but it is that investment from people, mm-hmm. the relationships that we build together. And you know, the truth of the matter is the majority of the people that worked on that campus probably will not ever meet a survivor that lives there. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's by design to protect them. And, you know, um, but 
it's still this like this bond, this relationship that mm-hmm. is so rooted in just the character and the nature of Christ mm-hmm. to provide something, to give of yourself to provide something for someone else so that they might find wholeness. Um, that's, that's, that's why we do what we do. Yeah. And it's just, it's just so incredible. It's just so incredible to feel in, and, and, you know, you can, when you walk into a place that's been abandoned, you get that kind of like sad feeling. You can feel how sad and dreary it is. Then you walk into a home where you can tell that people have spent time, they've spent energy. It's now being lived in. You, you just feel the love that's there and really the sisterhood that's even being bonded between our residents. So, uh, it's a really cool th- and I don't work out at the campus. I work, um, in town with the social enterprise, but, um, it's just so, it's so encouraging even for me when I'm out talking about the program to come in and to see really what God's doing. I yeah. wanted to read a testimony real quick of, um, from one of the women mm-hmm. from there, as you were talking, I was just remembering this story of her first time walking through the doors. Um, one of the things that Desiree talks about a lot, a program director who, who runs the Elijah Rising Restorative Care Program, is you know the, one of the primary goals of the program is to create a sense of, and you've already said it, family. Yeah. Like we have built a home not just to be clinical in, uh-huh. but to create a sense of family and belonging that will last long after two years. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I'm going to just read this real quick, just quotation from one of the women as they came there. She said... Um, it, she, it took her a long time to go from where she was to get to uh, our campus. Um, and so she said, as we were driving, I was kind of freaking out because the country style setting was so unfamiliar. Me too. I thought we, <laughs> she said, I thought we were lost. <laughs> then she says, as soon as I walked in, I couldn't believe that I was going to get to stay here. It's just so beautiful. Plush rugs, soft beds. Oh my gosh. And then my own closet. I've been here for a week, and it seriously feels like a fortress that was set up just for me. Our family-style dinners are the first I've had since I was a little kid. It's really nice. It's already starting to feel like home. So look, Elijah Rising didn't ever intend to be in aftercare, but we are. And that's because of God. Mm -hmm. That's because God threw us into this, and we said yes not just a yes, okay, fine, but a yes, and we had to engage a, a place of faith that was miraculous. And beyond our like capability understanding. Beyond. Totally beyond. Yeah. And so now we fast forward to this point to where we have testimonies like that that are occurring, where these women are coming in and they feel that way. And we can't stop. Yeah. We, let me say it better. Let me put that better. We won't stop. No. We won't stop doing this work. And because of that woman right there. So we're in the midst, you know, we're filming this podcast right now. I don't know when you're listening to it or when you're watching it, but we're filming this in the midst of a global pandemic and an economic crisis that, you know, our nation has not seen, well, ever. But we have not shut the doors to the restorative care campus. Yeah. We are, we continue to move forward. The residents are continue, they are provided for, at no cost to themselves, everything that they need every single day, including the highest quality of trauma therapy that anyone can get. And we're going to talk more about that on the next podcast. Um, And if you want to know more about trauma therapy, you can listen to the podcast previous to this one. Um, And we want to continue to do that. And that, how many more acres do we have to fill? (laughs) We have 83 more acres to expand onto. And we will expand. Yes, we will. So, the Elijah Rising Restorative Care Campus was built by committed followers of Jesus who engaged their faith, but by volunteers who said, yes, we want to be a part of that work. Mm-hmm. And so as we wrap up this episode of the Elijah Rising podcast, I just want to invite you, many of you, you're already involved. This is your story too. But if, if you haven't been a part of this process, I want to invite you into this work. I want to invite you into this story so that you can be a part of building a legacy. Mm-hmm for yourself, but more importantly, for those who have survived exploitation. So you can go to our website, ElijahRising.org, and find out more information. You can see pictures of the property, pictures of the home. Uh, There's a little bit of the story is written out there. Excuse me. And you can learn more about what we do. Our next episode will talk a little bit more about how we do it. And so I just want to encourage you, 
get engaged with what Elijah Rising is doing, what God's doing through Elijah Rising. You can also support us by buying some products. Why don't you give a quick yes. explanation about that? So when the women are in our program, we make sure, look, quick spiel. Have you read <laughs> Go. Proverbs 31? Oh, Sam's been on this recently. Proverbs 31, the majority of the verse is talking about the economic, like, um, just the beautiful economic hustle that this woman has. That's right. She's going to the market. She's picking out wool and flax. Her family's wearing purple. Her husband <laughs> goes to the market and they're like, oh, that's Sam's husband. And she stays, get, you know, doing all this <laughs> stuff. And I was so encouraged because I said, Lord, you have put Elijah Rising not only to empower um you know, we don't want to like have like all oh, these women, like we're just helping them do right. this, this, and this. No, we're actually saying you are who God made you and God has designed all of us, right. including women to be able to provide and to work and to see fruitfulness in the place of, you know, where they work. Yeah, that's and right. I read, I read that Proverbs verse and I interviewed our two new ladies that were hiring for the, um, the social enterprise. And I read that verse to them and I said, God created you for this. That's right. Like you have this in you and I will be your holy hustle coach until it comes out. And so we, if you shop at shop.elijahrising.org or you go to Elijah Rising, press shop, every, every cent of that is going to support the employment of survivors of human trafficking. All the only purpose of that business is to make yeah. money, to pay more women who have survived. So shop with us. And not to mention, we hold a big standard that we're not yeah. here to make a, you know, a kind of wishy-washy product that we yeah. don't care about just because of charity. No, you can give if you care. If you, right. if you don't want anything in return, we, we're not going to send you something terrible. We take such pride in what we make. It's good for the earth. It's good for us. We use economic, ethical chains. Um, we use, because it's important that we don't, we show these, these wonderful women that we're not hurting other people yeah. in order to make our money. Cause that's what happened to them. Right. That's right. Um, so we have ethical sourced items. Um, and they're really amazing. There's something that we're all proud of. We're always in, improving. So please go check out our shop. We have a wonderful candle of the month program where you, which is one of our recent bestsellers. You can sign up and you get a new candle in the mail every single month. Um, and if you don't like the scent, you can come in trade it out. No cost to you. Yeah. Um, so we're really, we're really proud of it. And I'm really excited that we're expanding, um, to hire more women to grow our, you know, and during, you know, this time of quarantine, we're really scared. We have a brick and mortar store, which is just turned a year old. We thought, Oh my gosh, is this going to shut down? And people have been just so faithful to order online. And we just had some really great launches. We have some wonderful mother's day shirts. That's right. Yeah. Um, So whenever this is, I promise you, we have cool stuff coming out because we're always yeah. aiming to change and grow and um, improve. So yeah, that's a huge way that you can support. And every time you make that purchase is you saying, I believe in this woman. I yep. believe in her future. I believe in her next resume that she's going to be able to fill out that application and get the job of her dream so she can be the person she always dreamed to be yeah. for her and for her kids one day. So it's a huge, huge thing. And it's something that you can use in your home. Great gifts. We really, really believe in our social enterprise. High quality products. I use them at home. We all do. So thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, check out our website, follow us on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, if you're listening to us on iTunes or Spotify. You can find a video version of this podcast on YouTube. So go subscribe everywhere you get your podcast. Uh, follow us. And we'd love for you to comment. Send us what you think about this conversation and uh, questions, other topics you want for the podcast to cover. Uh, yes. Let us know and we will we'll get to those. And so thanks for joining us and have a great day.